I'm Louisa Grieva from the National Endowment for Democracy. I'm very honored to be here. Turkestan, which from Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia, uh, and I will now uh, give a, a brief rundown of the important democratic institutions that the Tibetans have established in exile. And then I'd like to invite a little uh, participation for, uh, from our, our audience. Uh, but first, to just cover the basics. What do the Tibetans in exile have? That's important so that we can say they have a democratic experiment and experience. A constitution, uh, a future constitution for Tibet from 1963, and also a charter for Tibetans in exile from 1991. They have a representative government with a, in the parliamentary Function, the Chutwe, somebody tell me how to pronounce that. Chutwe, the Tibetan word for the Brahmin in exile. Directly elected. Huping uh, observed the one election. And a judiciary, the Supreme Justice Commission. Huping also mentioned it since 1991. There's also a democratic executive, which has gradually become uh, more and more democratic, accountable, transparent, and now uh, chosen. Uh, the Kalantripa institution was chosen by the parliament for 10 years, twice, and now, uh, since 2001, directly elected. And then this year, uh, Again, we have the election of Losan Sange, who will, I believe, be appearing later um, with a vigorous campaign. So we, the institutions of Tibetan exile democracy include political campaigns. This executive, Kalan Tripa, also appoints his own cabinet. And for those who may not be familiar with it, this government in exile, Central Tibetan Administration, under the direction of a cabinet, has Numerous functioning departments, finance, health, education, with over 80 schools, interior department administering over 50 settlements, foreign affairs, and a department of religion, with well over 3,000 employees, I think maybe uh, far more. There's also several independent commissions, a central election commission, an audit commission, maybe others that I don't know about. And finally, uh, two other important elements of democratic political life. What am I missing so far? The fourth estate, a free press, publications in Tibetan and English. And finally, the other institutions of civil society, NGOs. Tibetan Youth Congress, Tibetan Women's Association, think tanks, human rights groups. Now what is still missing in this uh, democratic universe of Tibetan political life among the exiled Tibetans? Political parties are still not active. There's one political party, but it is not active in elections. Uh, there are few watchdog NGOs. There are civil society NGOs. They pay attention to Tibet and the situation in their homeland. They try to increase civic life among Tibetans in exile. But they're not quite at the stage of acting like a watchdog and demanding a lot of accountability from the parliament and government. So that's coming in the future, I think. And even election monitoring, I'm proud to say that NED helped support an international election monitoring effort during the March uh, elections. There's a, a very nice report declaring that this election was free and fair, uh, despite having overcome the problems that Huping pointed out. 
and there's still recommendations for further improvements. But there's no, so far, no uh, organized local Tibetan effort. So these are some of the institutions, uh, and I believe that, uh, as Carl Gershman said and Losong Sande said, I believe it's very uh, admirable for Chinese to study this experiment and, and approach it in a spirit of, of learning from the practice and the experience. So in that spirit, I will end by making four suggestions about the spirit of friendship and learning and solidarity between Chinese and Tibetans who are all uh, hoping to experience real democracy in their political lives. And the first one is, I would like to uh, request that every Chinese who is here, and by the way, congratulations for being here. It's really not uh, a normal thing to expect everyone to spend a weekend talking about a very difficult political subject. But to go further, I'd like to ask everyone to learn how to say hello in Tibetan. <laughs> now, Kupi, can you uh, tell us how to say hello in Tibetan? Yang Li, did you learn it? Yang Chao. Shei? Shei Shou? Okay. Da Shang? Okay, everybody. Tash Delik. Tash Delik. Again? Again? Thank you. Don't forget all weekend. Please say this. Whenever you say hello to your Tibetan friends and Tibetans, please correct all of us when we don't say it correctly. Okay. Second suggestion, um, please follow Hu Ping's example and study the Tibetan democratic experience. Um, Hu Ping has been to Dharamsala. Yang Jeli has been to Dharamsala. Maybe Han Lan Chao. Not. Chia. Hai yo shi chi guo. Hai yo. Yi er san si liu chi ba jiu. Shi. Very good. I hope that many of you will look for more opportunities to do the same. Um, thirdly, I hope that um, there can be more translation. Many of the uh, documents from Tibetan Democratic Experiment are available in, in Tibetan and English. If there are more that need to be available in Chinese, I hope some of you will take this on on a voluntary basis. Um, and finally, uh, my fourth suggestion is that I hope many of you in your publications, your think tanks, your own professional work, you'll find a way uh, to celebrate the 51st anniversary of Tibetan Democracy Day, which is September 2nd. Last year, the Tibetans celebrated 50 years. That was the first election uh, after exile. And in that sense, it's a, a sad thing. You can only start Tibetan democracy in exile away from fleeing violence and repression, missing your homeland, understanding uh, that the conditions in your homeland are, are still terrible. But on the other hand, let's use it as a chance to celebrate the uh, determination and commitment uh, that the Tibetans have to turn this time away from home uh, into an opportunity to learn something new in the history of Tibetan civilization, that is how to practice democracy. And I hope that all of you will find a way to mark this and celebrate with the Tibetans. Thank you.